Hello, my name is Dr. Tom Bannett. I'm with the Battleship New Jersey and the Kane University Oral History Project. Today is September 19th, the year 2008. We're aboard the battleship in the executive office, officer's cabin during one of the ship's reunion. Today I'm talking with Mr. Charles J. Hodinger of Fremont, Ohio, who served aboard the battleship New Jersey from August 1950 to January 1954. He achieved the rank of gunner's mate third, worked in turret number two, and ultimately became gun captain of the left side gun in turret number two. Uh, Charles, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, let's start off the conversation. Tell me, how did you get involved with the battleship New Jersey? Well, as I said, uh, at 17, the Korean War had broken out, uh, and I was going to school at the time, and I quit school to join the Navy. I had a brother in the Navy World War II, and I guess that was my direction to go. And the war, being a young kid, I uh, thought it might be interesting. You mean the Korean War is going on? The at Korean the War had started in uh, June or July, I think, yeah. Now, did, did many other young men decide to quit school or as soon as gra they graduate, go into military? Was that common at the time? Uh, somewhat at that time, yeah. The, uh, scholastically, things weren't as necessary in that world as they are today, sure. yeah. So at age 17, you decided to join the Navy then? Yeah, that was my, yeah. What I had had friends uh, that had left school also and went uh, in the Navy also. And uh, I followed them by probably a month. I had to get my parents, mother particularly so, to sign the paper so I could join. Was she happy to sign? Was she? Yes. Very unhappy. She wanted you to stay in school and stay well, home. Well, yeah, home. didn't want to go into service during the period of war, apparently, yeah. Now, um, you go off to boot camp at Great Lakes Naval, Naval Great Training Center? Great Lakes Center. Naval Training Center. And talk a little bit about your boot camp experience. Oh, it was the general run of the mill, uh, the calisthenics, the swimming, the marching, which I wasn't very adequate or very well done at. Uh, and that was for a period of, I forget how many weeks we had uh, boot camp, firefighting, uh, very little gunnery, but some gunnery. That was that was about the size of that. I graduated with the group. And then once you're finished, where do you go to next? Okay, then uh, when you graduate and have your graduation from uh, Great Lakes, your uh, various groups are assigned to various stations. Some people going off to uh, training schools because they may be adept at it. Uh, others just as groups are, were assigned to different locations. I and a group of, uh, I can't think of how many in the group uh, that I was training with, we got sent to the USS New Jersey, which at that time was in mothballs at Bayonne, New Jersey. It had been mothballed after World War II, so we went aboard as a skeleton crew to start the recommissioning process. Okay, so we merely worked on the boat, cleaning thing, mainly cleaning at the level I was at. Uh, uh, we slept on the boat, but then we did our meals and our laundry at the base there in Bayonne, New Jersey. What, what condition did you find the ship to be in when it had been in mothballs, I think since 1948, only a couple, yeah. really several years? Well, you know, it's been so long. I guess oily, a lot of oil, hydraulic cleanup, uh, uh, we didn't get into any of the cocoon work or removing anything from uh, from the guns, uh, the mounts, or anything. Generally, clean up, I guess, so uh, by memory, uh, if it gives correct. And was it winter time in Bayonne? I'm Not a nice place to be in winter time. I went there. Uh, no, I remember going over to New York City, walking ashore with uh, uh, regular, just a uniform, yeah. So what happens after the ship now is ready and fit for okay, sea? Okay, well, it, it was ready to that degree. Uh, then we got underway, and I think, I'm thinking we may have went on a, no, we didn't. So we went from there over to Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, to go in dry dock for continued repairs and refurbishing. Uh, then we was there with they I remember going under the Brooklyn Bridge uh, at that time they had to take 
at the mast, they had to take some of the radar and stuff at the top of the, uh, uh, the mast off so we could get under the Brooklyn Bridge at low tide. Uh, and then the Navy Yard, uh, we went there. We was there for probably a couple of months in the dry dock. And I remember that uh, our duties were just normal deck duties during that period. But I do remember we was there in the hurricane that come up the uh, east coast that year, and that would have been in early 50, yeah, early 50, or no, late, I'm sorry, late 50 during the hurricane season. Uh, it come up and it hit up in that area. Uh, we had heavy winds, I remember that. And I was ashore uh, over in New York City uh, watching the wind start blowing. I've seen people in rain getting blowed right across the streets, knock them down and they just slide in the water, okay. And at that time, if my memory is correct, they, uh, I don't know how, what it was through, loudspeakers or what, ordered all crew members of the USS New Jersey to return to the ship. So we had to catch subways or whatever was available to get back to Brooklyn, uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And what happened is the tides came up so high with the uh, storm surge that it started filling the dry dock. It come into Brooklyn Navy Yard and started putting water in the dry dock. We're sitting in there with on blocks. Uh, and as the water's coming in, this thing is, has, will have a tendency to try to float and whatever happens, so they called all hands back and we worked, I worked on that with people in the rain, pouring rain and wind blowing, and they put hawsers out six, eight, ten each side to, to stabilize just in case there was any, any movement. Then, of course, storm passed and they pumped it out. So luckily the storm passed before the ship caused any damage to itself. Yeah, yeah, possibly. If that dry, if the dry deck would have filled up completely, it may have a tendency, just due to the draft and stuff, that it could have sided maybe. I don't know. That's what they thought. Now, once the ship is going to sea, ready to go to sea, and I right. guess over to Korea, uh, was the ship in good shape or was it just partially, you know, oh, uh, no, prepared? It was in good shape. Everything all... Everything was functioning well, guns. Uh, my particular area was the guns, 5-inch 40s. I, I worked on the 40 millimeters uh, in training and whatever, and then uh, eventually ended up in turret 2 for my permanent duty station. Uh, after leaving Brooklyn Navy Yard, we, we had a, a shakedown cruise down to Cuba, Guantanamo, and uh, did some firing there at Calibra, which is an island that the Navy fires on for and the Iowa relieved uh, Wisconsin. If you could just take a step back, the camera after working for two hours at a time okay. clicks off. All right. Has minus off. No all. problem. So you just then, to take a step back since we had a little camera trouble, um, the ship goes to Korea, and who did you relieve? What ship were, did you relieve? Uh, USS Missouri. Missouri that was on duty. That was on that, they were on their nine months tour, like. And then once you get to Korea, what happens? What does the ship start doing? Well, we were always we fired in support of ground troop movements, uh, fired in support of uh, any activity with our troops ashore, and then our one of our main obligations was uh, interdictory fire, uh, rail yards, uh, uh, trains, uh, bridges, uh, enemy encampments. Uh, we would go so far as up into uh, just below the Man Rasheen, I think it was Rasheen, just below the Manchurian border, and that was a main supply depot and uh, uh, where troops came through to go south. Yeah. Was there any fear of ever being attacked by North Korean or Chinese aircraft? Uh, the only time that we experienced that I did, I think that we experienced there was when we went up that one time. We went up with a uh, a carrier and a cruiser. And uh, the battleship went up, up to just outside, just at, near the Manchurian border again. They were flying the B-25s. There was about 15, 20 of them coming out of Japan. And they needed fighter support. And the fighter support couldn't come to Japan with them due to the rain. So they, we went with the carrier up there. The carrier launched planes. Uh, and then these bombers come over just above, I, I remember clearly being on deck and hearing the roar there. I think there were four engines, maybe. I'm pretty sure again, but you can look up and 
see, almost see the rivets in the uh, in the planes. They were flying that that low. That then. low, and that was due to radar detection from ashore. So they would fly below the radar then. That was, they was trying to. Sure. Yeah, they did. Yeah, but I never heard. Uh, I'll never forget the roar. You could hear them coming, and uh, as they passed by, it just about knock you down on the deck. Now. Talk to me a little bit when you're working in... Um, well, oh, one more, sorry, one Go more ahead. thing on that. The only time, uh, there was always the threat of air attack, a possibility. Uh, there, when we pulled up into the, near the shore there, up in, in North Korea, before the bombers came, uh, and before they even launched planes from the carriers, or the carrier, uh, they sounded uh, the air alarm because they spotted MiGs flying out observing. Apparently that's what it was. They uh, were observing what what was down there. Uh, they sent planes up, my memory tells me. Uh, of course, they shot right back into Manchuria, or that way, into North Korea. Yeah, that, that's the only anything we had fear of any air attack. Now, when you're in turret number two on the left left gun, talk to me, what happens when you're, you're operating firing? What, what goes on? Describe well, it, as gun captain, which I was uh, at the point in making uh, gunner's mate third class, I was assigned to that duty station. Uh, prior to that, though, I had worked at all the trainer operator, the elevation operator. I had worked in all those positions. Uh, and I had worked in guns under other gun captain. But uh, my job was to direct loading the gun, uh, practicing all the safety needs in loading the gun. Uh, uh, I worked the hoist, or I worked, I'm sorry, I worked the, the tray. That was my obligation. I worked the rammer, which rammed the projectile. And then uh, you had uh, one, or I forget now, you had a, a projectile man that managed that. And then you had uh, two guys or one, I, well, I can't remember that right now. One or two and the powder hoist. They had the powder hoist had six bags come up three at a level in that hoist. And they all went in there. You, you, first of all, the projector come up, then you pushed a lever and it laid it down into this tray that went up into the breech. Then you had a rammer come out, chain rammer like a lever. It pushed that projectile. You'd ram it all the way till she got, till the, the, the brass got into the, you know, the chamber. Yeah, into chamber. the chamber, so for rotation. And then you did that, and you pulled the rammer back, and then you laid three bags of powder out of the powder hoist. Then you rammed them, and, uh, and then after you rammed them, you come back, and you drop the other three, and you rammed them. And then as gun captain, you uh, made sure the breech block was closed, and, uh, uh, and, and you ins then you inserted a uh, firing pin, or primer, firing primer, inserted that into the breech. But the breech was... Uh, all air assisted, uh, you'd get a hold of it, give her a little jump, and then she'd go up. And then you push it in, interlocking, and the breech was probably a foot and a half thick with interlocking grooves, and it went into the, uh, the chamber of the gun, the breech block, locked it up, and then you give a signal that you were loaded, it went up and lights out in the, uh, out of the, uh, in the, the main part of the turret where the Turret's chief or lieutenant would be, uh, and that was that was your duty as gun captain. Uh, the other guys, their duties was uh, the shell, the uh, powder magazine, and then when you're off, when you're not firing, uh, I and uh, the, I think four guys that worked for me in that particular gun room, uh, their responsibility, including with my own, is uh, hydraulic oil cleanup. It, uh, everything in uh, turret two or, or the 16s is uh, 89, 90 percent hydraulically operated. So consequently, old lines, you always had hydraulic leaks and the base of the gun uh, room, uh, you'd have, we had mop, we had rags and buckets and that was their duty and to shine things up, keep things looking good, yeah. Now, when the gun fired, um, would it fire would they fire all three, or quite often would one guy gun fire on itself for a certain fire mission? Well, at certain times, uh, it would be random fire with either or any of them. Uh, there were times we had uh, three gun salvos. Uh, I recall one time, uh, whether that was for show or what, we had uh, 
I recall, and I don't know when it was, a nine gun salvo. All three turrets fired their three guns simultaneously, or they did for fire control. And, uh, uh, but uh, as far as firing, you were assigned, uh, each turret might be assigned a target, or maybe one. We did a lot of, uh, uh, what they call it, three section duty. Two would be off, one would be on, they would be firing the five inch or the uh, 16s, and that'd be one gun, maybe two, maybe turret three would fire one day, uh, maybe turret two another, turret one, uh, randomly, whatever chosen, yeah. Now, each gun, depending on the number of times it's fired, loses its accuracy a little bit, because the gun wears out. Uh, did, do you recall any of the barrels, the three barrels, in turret number two being less accurate than the others just because of overuse or defects? Uh, no, technically I probably wouldn't have gotten into that. We, we did have a, we did have a program, uh, a duty, I forget how often it was that each barrel was, we had muzzle barrel cleaners you pulled through with, with ropes and big blocks and took the lead and, or the brass and stuff out of them and the lead. Uh, See, when you, uh, I'm trying to think, how was that? After or before? Uh, I can't, what, before we had, the, they had a big stack of uh, tin foil or lead foil, and you'd grab six, eight sheets of that, and you threw them in the breech either before the projectile or after. I'm thinking before the projectile, but I won't say for sure. You threw them in, uh, and I'm trying to think the, the reason for it. Would that help clean out the barrel or something? Uh, I, I, see, I can't remember that. Let but, me just for a second close that door because it popped open. Oh, get, oh, I wonder. A little bit noisy. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're back, back in operation. Okay. Um, but after uh, now, after you would fire a round uh, out of your uh, out of any of the uh, guns. Uh, they had an air, you pushed a button that sent air up through the barrel and out, out through the muzzle. And that was to clear it of any residue from the powder bags or anything so your next loading wouldn't be, uh, would not be affected by any burning material or otherwise, yeah. Now, most of the gunpowder you were using, it was probably left over from World War II, right? Yeah, 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 Was there any defect of powder or shells that you ever knew about? No, not that I know of. Yeah. The no. reason I ask that is during the Vietnam period, they were still using World War II powder and shells because they, they had it around. Yeah, exactly. The problem is it was sometimes inaccurate. The powder wouldn't burn properly. Yeah, I, and they had, they had some trouble with the accuracy of the guns. I've run into that before. Okay. Just wonder if you had any No, not, that. nothing that I would be uh, informed of or mm -hmm. know of. Uh, basically, as a gun captain, my only responsibility was keep the gun operating properly, clean, uh, and loading it properly. Was there any competition between the three guns in your turret to see who could be better? Did you... Was well, yeah, we had, uh, I don't know whether it was competition, there was training in uh, the amount of time it took to get a round ready to fire. And I, anymore, I'm, whether it's a minute, I can't remember anymore. I think it was two rounds a, uh, a minute, which would be okay. very, which to me would be very quick firing. That's very quick yeah, now, People yeah. have told me, technically it's two, two rounds. rounds a minute, but you can't keep that up for very long. Um, uh, it could be done, yeah, I, I'd say, I, and I can't remember, but... Sure. Uh, now, was it did you get tired out doing that work? Was a lot of physical movement and uh, heat? Not, not really. Everything's assisted with mechanical assist. Okay. Uh, like, uh, I, I, uh, another thing I did, I worked uh, pretty well, well-versed on uh, the 16-inch turrets, especially. I, I began working in the powder rooms, which are way down, about six decks down, that surround each barbette, uh, the turret barbettes. They supply the powder bags to put in the hoist to go up to the guns. I worked the there. Of all hands, there is a bus available on the pier for transportation from the New Jersey vets. Uh, of all hands, there is a bus available for transportation on the pier for New Jersey vets. Yeah, that, uh, I worked there, and then from there I went to the shell deck, which they have two for each turret, two shell decks within the barbette protected and all the projectiles, armor-piercing and HC, are around the barbette and the outside. This is a drill, this is a drill. Flight quarters, flight quarters. 
flight quarters. All designated personnel man your flight quarter stations to launch helo aft. Smoking lamp is out on all weather decks. Stand clear aft to frame 137. Now flight quarters. This is a drill. This is a drill. That's part of the oral history interview process. Oh, you okay. have to hear all the announcements going okay, on. Yeah, I continue on. Probably remember. Uh, uh, that, the shell decks, I worked on them, I worked on both of them, That's, uh, that was all mechanical, it was, I mean, those big things, uh, 2,800, 2,700 pounds and 3,000 pounds for the different two projectiles, and they were all just slid across the metal deck with uh, a rope around them and uh, put it there and then they hooked it onto your shell hoist, whichever gun you were taking the shell to, uh, you'd just take and pull that baby and keep going and she'd slide across the deck and and she'd get up close and you jerk the pull tight on the rope and it slap her into that hoist. And then of course you push the button or they pushed it there. I forget the communication thing. But uh, that would hoist up into the tray in, right in the gun room, stick it up and then you'd lever it down. It'd go down in the tray and then you'd ram it, yeah. Now is there ever any training accidents? I could, because somebody uh, I just interviewed from World War II said that on one ship, uh, a cruiser, that somebody was sleeping in a 16-inch gun, and when the gun had to fire quickly, it elevated and crushed the man. Did you ever have accidents like that where people got fingers crushed, broken? The fingers, yeah. I uh, all I can relate to there, uh, up in the turret, the gun rooms. No, not that I know of. Uh, in the powder handling room, they had a turn the handle, work both ways. Uh, I turned it, make it ready for you ready and the guy on the other side of the barbette and this brass tray went through and it had a big handle on it, you'd go like that, it had a knife edge, it would go, it would close you off in the powder room when you had your powder bag in it and they out there they'd get it and put it in the hoist. Some guy, I remember one guy, somebody misconnected on turning the, uh, the proper uh, area for the, the turner, some guy got two or three fingers chopped pretty good. That's the only one I know of any accident in the turret, yeah. So but, safe, safety was, it sounds like, was quite important to the people, correct? Safety was quite oh, important. Oh yeah, well, as I said, like you said, or like you heard, uh, you know, there's so much power and weight and, uh, uh, all, and, you know, everything is, it's not coordinated movement. It's right now, like, everything's hydraulic and, uh, when you push the lever or whatever, I mean, she goes into position, yeah. So, yeah, it was, uh, but as far as physical labor, the most physical would be probably the guy in the powder handling room that had to get the bag out of the three bag containers and get it and take it and put it in, in this uh, tray so he could turn it into the, that was probably about the heaviest job, yeah. They, what, those powder bags weigh 105 uh, pounds each? No, no, uh, my memory, there was smokeless powder. Uh, it had pure silk bags so it burned quick uh, smokeless powder and in my memory it was 60 pounds a bag at the time I remember uh, which would be you six 360 pounds of powder to uh, send a projectile out yeah um, what was the morale of the crew like during the Korean War uh, was it it was it, World War II was extremely popular yeah. Korea was, it's sometimes called a forgotten war. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, so I'm asking about the morale of the crew, that they feel they're doing an important job, how are they received back home and so on like that. Oh yeah, I don't think, I don't think at that period in the war, or of that particular war, which was one that we got our call to do without somebody attacking us, but I think, uh, I don't think that atmosphere was there, that they felt they were doing something unjust or indifferent. I think, uh, at least I felt, it was experience and also, uh, as war goes, you were doing something in a war. I mean, that's how I looked at it. I... How about uh, when you got back to the United States, how did people receive you back after your, uh, your coming back on leave or so like that? Yeah, real good, yeah. Good. Yeah, real good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I never had any trouble, you know, you come home, you go, go to the bar and get a couple of beers and see if you had any buddies around and go out and mess around a little bit, but other than that, no, I never... No, and I had, uh, when I was stationed, uh, when the ship was in Norfolk a few times, that was our home port, uh, put your uniform on, and I hitchhiked from Norfolk to Cleveland, Ohio, and Fremont, Ohio, two or three different times. You'd be getting uh, picked up uh, for hitchhiking. For you know, people, yeah. Hitchhiking. It would give you rides very easily. 
Oh yeah, that people just boom. I had people uh, coming towards Cleveland, stop and buy my supper <laughs> and everything. You know, so no, they was very gracious. Yeah. Um, how about during on the ship off the coast of Korea? Uh, did people get tired there um, being on the gun line for so long and being on on duty? No, I no. Uh, from my perspective, that's where I wanted to be. I, uh, I, uh, I, I. Do you enjoy it? Yeah, I, I enjoyed. It. What I was doing, you know, uh, however enjoyment you get for it. I, in fact, is, uh, and this is a true fact. I, I went in the Navy because my brother was a World War II Navy guy. He's dead now. Uh, I even made efforts, in which I thought they were futile, to get ashore as an observer or as a anything to to get ashore. I wanted I wanted to be there, but it, I, you know, I didn't get it. Of course, that was. But uh, uh, I, I, the closest I got to shore was, uh, I, was I volunteered on a uh, whaleboat. Uh, they took in uh, three Marines, and I was, and I was, I uh, want to, I volunteered, uh, I, I really wanted, I don't ask me why, I, have, I was 17, 18 years old, but uh, I got to be bow hook on a, on a whale boat, and then they had the operator, the motor guy, whatever he called, coxswain, and we took, uh, I think it was three or four Marines, and we had sidearms, 45s, Marines had their, had, yes, uh, the Marines had their, Weapons, automatic weapons, whatever they were. They, and a radio man went ashore. They, we went ashore. We took them in. I didn't go ashore. We uh, laid off the rocks. They went ashore. There was a railroad tunnel there uh, along the uh, shoreline. And they was ashore at a spot. A train, during the day, these trains would move, and they'd go inside the, under these hills and mountains and hide in there all day. Then at night, they would make their movement. And uh, that's what these spotters were took them uh, uh, over there for, and let them off on land uh, to the railroad tracks or whatever was there. Uh, at that particular night, there was no train moving, uh, so we brought them back, come back to the ship. At so the, you just landed a small team of spotters then is that that night, right? Yeah, they wanted them to see if there was a train and if it was going to start moving. They'd coordinate it with the ship and they'd fire on it. Now, what you recall the incident? At Wonsan, where one of the crewmen was killed, when yeah. you're you're at you're anchored in the harbor. Anchored in the harbor. And yep. tell me what happens. What what do you recall from that? Okay, incident? I recall very clearly. Probably a couple of nights before, I knew this Robert Osterwind uh, uh, as a shipmate, not as a friend, because uh, and I knew him mainly because I met him, and he was from Detroit, and I live in Ohio, uh, a matter of a hundred miles from where I live, where he lived. And that's why there was a little bit of a, let's talk about it. And uh, probably, I don't know what night it was before, uh, I don't, we was at General Quarters for a couple of days there, I know, or one day. But one of the nights before we are, had liberty to go below decks, not on the main deck. Uh, and he was playing cards. We played cards. It was about four or five of us playing poker using matchsticks. We had a value on the matchstick. Uh, 10 cents or whatever it was. And at the end of the, the game, whoever had your mat, you, I don't know whether, I forget how we regulated that. You wrote down in your book who you owed from that night of uh, poker or that little session. And you had it, I got, in fact, I still got the book at home, little little pocket thing there. And uh, he was playing cards with us uh, and uh, two or three other guys from our, my division. And, and, and uh, I probably shouldn't even talk about this. Matter of fact, when that game got done, I owed Robert Osterwind. I had 10 match chicks he had of mine. I owed him like $2, maybe 2 bucks, $2.70. Uh, in my book, I got it in there. And uh, of course, the next morning or two mornings later, he's dead. Well, getting back to that, uh, we was at general quarters for all day and all night, at least, firing. Everybody at their battle station, they brought you the food in the little tin containers to your battle station. And uh, that morning, 
they announced we were going to go to condition three, which is one condition manning the guns and doing the introductory firing, they called it, at factories, rail yards, troop movements, whatever. Uh, and so, and uh, two other uh, condition, the two other ones on condition three were off duty to do their cleanup, uh, whatever work they had to do, uh, uh, and uh, then go to breakfast. So I was off there, off of turret two, we were shut down, or uh, yeah, we was not, we was not manning. Went to breakfast down below and ate breakfast. Everybody glad to get out of their battle station. So they go up through the, uh, up on the main deck and the fan tail back here. Uh, and the whole fan tail's just a whole bunch of guys back there just getting, getting fresh air. And we're sitting in there and you could see Juan Son there and the trees and the stuff. And, and every once in a while the five inch would let loose of a round. And I don't know about the 16s at that time. Uh, so I'm, we go up there, and they had to go. They had the main hatch closed, the big, the big hatch that goes up. And all they has is the scuttle. That's the one in the middle that's about that big around. Okay, that was open. Then they had to go up the ladder and then squeeze through that, or vice versa. And I'm sitting there, me and uh, kids from Syracuse, New York, uh, Scanio. His name was. They named his name there. He was the first name they named. Uh, one was wounded that day, and. Uh, he and I, he's in my, he was in turret two in my division, and uh, we're sitting on a loading boom that was bad. They're gone now, but I see they had long loading booms, and we're sitting on those and look, looking, look, I'm just, we're just smoking and looking, just looking at uh, Korea there, at, at Wonsan and the water and a couple other ships in there firing, and we're sitting there, and all of a sudden we're looking out there, and I, oh, from here to, oh, maybe over in land there, a little further, I, we see a burst in the water. See the water go up, and then you heard the report. And I said to him, I says, hey, look there, I said, I bet, that, I bet that cruiser had a hang fire, which once in a while they do. That sh sh they'll go out and then they'll drop real quick for whatever reason. And I said, I bet that cruiser had a hang fire. And yeah, and look, and people are starting to look. And, and all of a sudden, another burst comes a little closer from here to the, maybe the, uh, the place over there where, where you come here. and. Uh, then that one, she burst and blew up, and uh, and seen that, and then when that happened, uh, you heard the report, and then they sounded general quarters. So uh, he said, "We lie." I said, "Lay down." I laid right down on the deck, and I'm from here to from that hatch was right in the middle of the fantail. Uh, that's probably 20 feet from it where we was on that boom. So I lay down. He dropped down beside me. I said, "Lay down." I said. And I, I got my head right in that wooden deck. I, all I could do is just tunnel vision. And he says, look back here in the fantail, the, uh, uh, the port side uh, 40 millimeter, which we had them on then, uh, had a loading hatch on the side that was open where they put the, 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 I mean, the, the magazines. And, and that's laying open. And he's laying there and he says, look back there. He says, that, uh, that hatch is open. We can get back there. Because around this uh, uh, scuttle, those guys are just there and they're just they're banging each other and trying to push them through. I'm, I'm in believe it. And there was a cook up there, and not making because I'm fat now, but a large cook. He got out through there. He made it out. But I'll tell you, he's in, and, and this is a, another very true story. I'm laying there and I'm watching him. Come on, let's hurry up, get down there. And these guys are just going, and these guys are actually trying to, trying to squeeze and just like popping him through. And I finally got to it, but during this interim, he says, let's run back and get in that, go in that loading hatch. And I said, no, I said, it's better stay here. And all of a sudden, he jumped up, started running back down there. That's, well, from there, it's probably 40 feet, 50 feet, yeah, 50 feet. And then that next burst, the next shell, I heard it go over. I heard it whine and whistle like they do in a little roar, train deal. They were eight inch shells, they said. And that, that had a, Above the above the water explosion, and then I heard the shrapnel come back and hitting it. It got him two or three places in his leg. In fact, I, she showed me a chunk next day or next two days, and that's the one that got uh, Osterwin. He was on that side of the ship. And he was going up the ladder to go to O1 level to get up to the turret, and he had. And this is exactly how I interpreted. It. He's reaching up on that rope or what we had there, the chain, and that chunk just come in here and. Just tore him wide open, yeah. Uh, and I, but I, uh, I just laid there. I didn't, uh, 
but you could hear that shrapnel banging all over. And uh, but that that's how that happened, and that was. Uh, and the, my buddy, he got it in the leg. He left the ship after getting treated there, uh, hospital ship. Now I'm, he, I'm sure he got discharged, yeah. But uh, that's how that was. There was a whole bunch of guys back there just wanting to get fresh air. And, uh, and then they have to send an anchor crew up to retrieve the anchor under fire. And that, <laughs> but uh, as I, I seen photos uh, in a magazine I've got from the ship, where uh, the five inch, I think it was the five inch, it knocked out the gun emplacement that they figured fired on us. Yeah, so. Uh, what, how did the crew react to this when they found out that a member of the crew was killed and yeah, several wounded? I don't know. I, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I knew the guy too. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know what emotions you had. I can't really say at this time. Yeah, yeah, it's, you, you, well, I guess your mind were at war and. Somebody's going to get killed. I don't know what attitude other anybody ever has, but yeah, it ain't like you. No, you don't lay down and cry. I, I remember that. I, uh, I I thought about him and knew about him. I knew where I stood with him, and uh, but emotionally, apparently there was no great emotion other than not good, you know. But uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I and an extent what it does uh, with me anyhow. It instilled respect and fear for that almighty shell, which prior to that I fired a 22 at home and never killed nobody, but when you see what the shrapnel can do and you hear it banging and hear those shells go off, uh, you know, that changes your, your thought. That was the first time that I was over there with the ship. And uh, at that time, and this is another true story, I slept uh, in Division Two, which is right at the bow, where, where the bow makes a little bit of a swing and that water hits there and you can even, you now my bunk was right here up next, about this far from the side of the ship at that location. And that's just a little bit above the water line. And at night I'd sleep there and I, uh, you, you could even hear the water kind of moving. You could hear it through that metal. And, uh, and that happened and then that happened that tour, and I had to stay there. Then I made the gunner's mate third, which gave me the opportunity to sleep in the turret. They had bunks for long-term general quarters in the turret. They had some bunks for the, your key people, uh, gunner's mates and the GMs, and uh, I, I slept in there the second tour. I was in there when they signed the peace treaty. Uh, I thought the second, yeah, the first time I didn't, you know, this, this was a game. Second time I seen that and knew it, and the second time I, I thought you know anything possibly could happen, although it was relative. So you, you felt safer than in, in, in the, the turret. turret itself, oh yeah. yeah, well you know. It, and where do they have the bunks in the turret? Uh, there, each gun room has a couple of bunks. Then there's some bunks down below in the in the trainer operator in that area. There's several bunks, and there's some right up in the the main turret where the where the chief or the lieutenant that there's bunks there uh, yeah so I took advantage of that and but uh, but prior to that I didn't uh, you know you don't you hear about that and I didn't have any fear about it and then and then I don't know it was the second time over or the first time I was on the fantail that morning after breakfast having a cigarette right at the right on the fantail at the back and I'm watching this destroyer coming along we're out we're not at the bomb line which is where we fired we're out with the fleet He's coming along there, and I'm looking, I'm smoking, looking at it. And all of a sudden, I see this, so I see a big black plume of uh, water and smoke go in the air like about 40, 50 feet, I'm guessing. And I look, I thought, what? And then I hear the report, the bang, after a couple seconds, hell of a loud explosion. And here it's this USS Walk, the one that hit the mine. And they lost, uh, I don't know how many people they lost, but I've seen that. And as soon as it uh, exploded, and shortly thereafter, they sounded general quarters. So everybody went to their battle station and went into a zigzag course, uh, my memory tells me, because they didn't know whether it was a torpedo or a mine. I guess since they've determined it probably was a mine, because uh, out of North Korea, the rivers, they just let floating mines out into the, in, into the sea. And uh, uh, we were involved in blowing up a couple, and I watched destroyers and cruisers fire on them and blow them up whenever they'd spot them. 
But uh, this walk now that night or that evening about six or just before it got dark, uh, that come alongside of us had a hell of a hole and had a pretty good list on it. And we put a high line across uh, and at sea we're moving and they bring back, uh, bring over to our ship, I, I, I'm thinking 18 bodies, but it could have been maybe 16. So 16 or 18 bodies they brought across in the wire baskets by high line. And what they did, wherever they, wherever they went down, the, the ones they couldn't bring naturally were trapped it, it hit near the uh, boiler room compartments where the guys, the engineers slept. Of course, they had to set watertight integrity, and uh, so if there were some living, they were drowned. But they transferred these guys across, and they, they went wherever they were laying on deck and however, compartments. Uh, of course, the Navy had the white wool blankets. They just laid the bodies in the blankets, and then just took the blankets over, and then laid them in the stretcher, put the straps across, and, and I'm watching, I'm just a kid then, they're pulling them across the, there, and, and all these, about half of these blankets, they're starting to turn red because they're still seeping blood, you know. And uh, they took them just like they were down in the uh, vegetable cooler in, in the fantail there, took them down there and laid them row by row uh, overnight. Next day, they take them to the outside crapper on, on that side of the ship where the scupper went out right into the, well, they all went out into the ocean, the sea, and they embalmed them in there. The, med the medics or whoever embalmed them, and because uh, I, you could see the shit going out, their stuff going out, and uh, they embalmed them all, and then they had, back then we had wooden boxes. They put them in wooden caskets, and then took them to cooler, and I don't remember whether we went back to Japan and they, they took them off. I don't know how we got rid of the bodies, but, uh, but that was, uh, that was quite an experience there. And then we picked up probably, I recall, uh, we, we, we went to a, a, a Korean, North, South Korean minesweeper. They got hit by shore battery and <laughs> they were about half sunk and uh, we went alongside and picked them up. And uh, I know a couple of them, one of them had his hand blown off and uh, uh, North or South Korean guys, and they brought them aboard and I don't, I don't remember, incidentals. Then we picked up probably I remember one pilot distinctly, clearly we picked up that had the ditch. He was shot, shot up, and he was wounded, but he had a ditch at sea, and, uh, and uh, he radioed, and we go to the location, and I remember looking out and seeing the parachute floating in the water and see his body with his Mae West laying there just floating, but he, he was dead, you know. But uh, yeah, that was the, that experience. Uh, so how, when you're looking back, and we have to wrap up, final question. Yeah. That's how does all this, how has your experiences on the battleship impacted your later life? Oh, I would say due to the, what, the training, the, the authority given, uh, uh, I, I think it was good, yeah. I, I think it made a, uh, a, left an impression on me, uh, what life's all about to some degree at the level I live at, but uh, I, I was always, I always took, well, pride, whatever, and you know, I come from nowhere special, so I took pride in being involved in something of that magnitude, uh, and that was about it. Yeah, to me, I would say, uh, if would you do it again uh, immediately? I would. I wouldn't change a thing. I'd do it immediately. Is there anything else that you'd like to leave for the historical record? Anything I sh didn't ask about or comment? That you think is important. Well, there's one other thing. Now, I, I, I looked at a, uh, I know the, knowing the people that have served over the years, all the way from World War II to Vietnam uh, now, and then uh, Beirut, uh, the Persian Gulf, uh, I see, uh, I've seen a ship's roster over there at this place over here, and uh, I'm going through the H's, and I don't see no Hottinger. And now, and it said at the bottom, the best of our ability, uh, you know. I thought it should be in there, but it wasn't. <laughs> but uh, yeah, now I, I have uh, each year they put out a, what do you call it, a, uh, like a year book for the year of 50 and then 53 with, uh, you know, your, your ship pictures, your name and stuff. So I got those for, for the kids, you know, that's all it's for. Uh, one other thing, I'm in the picture down here. You've ever seen the, the big picture they got? Yes. 
Yes. Sir. Taken in 1952. I'm in there. I have just found myself again. Yep. Something to show your kids when you bring them. Yeah, I got one at home. They when they took them, they give all the crew members uh, ro rolled up. It's about this long, but you know, little figures. Now this one, I could find myself real quick. Yeah.